Hey, and welcome to futurethinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, popular episodes, and to join our community, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. Welcome back to the show. This is part two of our interview with John Verveke, lecturer at the University of Toronto, author of the book Zombies in Western Culture, a 21st Century Crisis, and creator of the YouTube series Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. In this episode, we talk about self-transformation, transcendence, and the practices for creating meaning. You can find all the links and show notes for this episode at futurethinkers.org slash 99. And to listen to part one of this interview, go to futurethinkers.org slash 98. Check out our new course in Personal Evolution. Part one is on cultivating sovereignty and is designed to support you in developing more clarity about your direction and purpose in life, making better decisions, and having more agency to live your life on your own terms. Part two is on integrating the shadow and is designed to support you in overcoming nihilism and tapping into an inner source of energy, creativity, and wisdom to make meaningful progress towards actualizing your full potential. To learn more, go to courses.futurethinkers.org. I'd love to talk further about uh, transformation and Mm -hmm. uh, transcendence because you often talk about how meaning, wisdom, and transcendence are three things that are kind of orbiting each other and there's some sort of gravity happening between them. And when they they get decoupled, problems occur. Yes, very much, very much. So I argue that that's, uh, that's... part of what I call the cultural cognitive grammar that is the legacy of the axial revolution. So we, we adopted a whole bunch of important psychotechnologies for very mundane reasons, alphabetic literacy, um, coinage, a bunch of other things along the way, right? Um, and we forget how much these things are historical inventions. Literacy is not natural to us. Uh, you, know, ab, 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 you know, mathematics is not natural to us. It may be, we may have innate, innate tendencies, but think having abstract symbol systems is, Right. That, again, um, you know, forget we forget how much graphing is a psychotechnology that was invented by Descartes. Like we forget all this. So part of this, what the series is, is to get people to realize this. But we have a whole bunch of psychotechnologies that create really enhance our cognitive power uh, in what Bella calls second order thinking, our ability to critically and extensively and more rationally reflect on our own cognitive processes. And, and that really makes people aware of, you know, the, 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 the systematicity of their self-deception. But it also, of course, makes them aware of the very thing that made them aware of it, which is their capacity for self-transcendence. And then what happens is the notion of meaning and the notion of wisdom change in the actual revolution. It goes, it, 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 because of the pervasiveness of this sense of, being beset by self-deception, but also being capable of self-transcendence. Uh, the idea is, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, in some sense, see through illusion. I'm trying to break out of a world that is, in some sense, a shadow or a decadent fall from a, a, a greater reality. Now, these are mythological ways of talking, and I'm not committed to the mythology, uh, and I, I make that very clear. Also, but I don't treat, I don't treat the word myth as a term, a derogatory term, meaning stupid stuff that people believe pervasively or something like that. Myths are, right, they're symbolic ways of trying to grasp perennial problems, perennial patterns, and pivotal moments in which we address perennial problems, right? But I think this is a myth, nonetheless, it's a mythological way of trying to articulate this sense of, wait, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm bereft by self-deception. Uh, and I, and, 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 but I'm capable of self-transcendence. Okay, so what do I need? What do I fundamentally need? I'm not saying that any, although I think Plato in some ways might have said it the clearest in some ways. What I need is I need machinery for overcoming self-deception. And what that means is I've got to, I got to really become much more aware of this internal, right, environment and how there's various forces and factors that are operating against each other. And be- and what they do is they very much skew what I find salient and relevant in ways that are all ultimately the source. I mean, almost all the accounts of cognitive bias, cognitive self-deception in the literature are based on some notion of internal conflict. And so you get, I need machinery for resolving the internal conflict, bringing kind of a, a, right a, a, an inner peace where it's not where I'm not using peace to mean 
like just lack of conflict, I'm meaning an optimality of coordination, right? So that's a kind of fullness of being. And, and, and one of the insights is that's, that seems to be a meta drive in us. In addition to whatever we desire, we desire that the satisfaction of it is satisfied within something that is comported with our inner peace and our optimal functioning. Like if I said, I'll, you know, I'll give you lots of sex and wealth and power, but you're going to be riven by anxiety and un right, right, and, and inner conflict. You go, no, no, I don't want that. Thanks. I'll just, I'll just stick with what I got, right? But the other thing, the other thing, and this points towards, right? Th that's one way of self-transcending, right? And it, it's more meaningful to you precisely because you have that meta drive. It's constitutive of your agency that you have this optimality of coordination, right? But Right. The self-deception also shows you that you're not in contact with reality. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and that's also really important. I talk about this. I use this as a standard example. You probably heard it in one of the videos or maybe uh, in one of the interviews. I'll, I'll standardly do this with uh, you know students in my class. I'll say, how many of you are deeply satisfying romantic relationships right now? You know, put up their hands. And, and I'll say, how many of you would want to know that your partner was cheating on you, even if that meant that that would destroy the relationship. And 90% of them keep up their hands. Because notice, they'll say, I'll give up this thing, which by the way, is one of the most reliable predictors of meaning in life, having deep relationships with other human beings. They'll give that up without a moment's hesitation, precisely because it's not real, mm. right? Right, and so what, you need what you need is you also need these capacities for overcoming the self-deception not only to get right to get this inner peace but also to enhance the connectedness uh, to reality and i think that's another part of what goes into making our 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 lives meaningful we sense that we're more connected to others to the world, to the course of our own life. There's a kind of coherence and purpose and, and depth, significance. And what, what I thought was, and this is why he gets to be Plato, uh, and, uh, I, and none of us will, I suppose, <laughs> um, is that um, Plato saw that those two things are deeply interrelated together. Because as I optimize the coordination, the, in, the inner integration, I reduce the inner conflict which reduces the self-deception. So I start to see more clearly into the world. I start, the world starts to become an arena in which I can tra train the skill of realization, of picking up on real patterns. But as I get that skill, I can then use it on myself. So I see, I realize better the optimality. I reduce the self-deception. As I reduce the self-deception, I can go deeper into reality and the thing loops like this. And so, these meta desires that are so constitutive of our, of our meaning are actually deeply, deeply integrated together. And so that looping that's in a coordinated and integrated fashion satisfying these meta desires makes your life inherently more meaningful because you're coming to a fullness of being, a deep deepness of connectivity. It is ongoing process of self-transcendence because that's what you do to overcome self-deception. And it seems to be at least core parts of what we mean by wisdom, right? The wise person is the person who's got this optimality, this deep kind of inner peace that allows them to see deeply into the reality of situations, but not just abstractly, but in this evolving involvement with those situations, precisely because they are on a course of development that they can facilitate others entering. That's why I see the three as deeply interwoven together. It's it's interesting because there seems to be just something very uh, archetypally human about this process because I see the same thing repeated in so many different traditions. Yes, uh, yes. For example, that was just the core of Jung's theory of what people should do in life, the shadow yes, integration. Yeah. He says it's the yeah. path to wisdom, it's the path to awakening, it's the path to seeing reality more clearly because yes. it's taking these things we're unconscious of, our self-deceptions, and trying to bridge the gap into bringing them into coherence. He said, it's the single most important thing you could do in life. I, I, and I don't, uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, uh, of course, we, uh, just to exercise a little bit of care, I, I totally agree. And I think that's important. Um, but of course, we have to remember that, you know, Jung is, because he, he explicitly mentions it, the theory of the archetypes is influenced by Plato's theory of the forms. And Jung is deeply, deeply also influenced by, uh, by Gnosticism, which is also, and Gnosticism and Neoplatonism are like interwoven in really complex 
historical ways. I try to articulate some of that in the series. Uh, so what I'm saying is I, I agree with you and I think it's important. I just didn't want to give the impression that Jung's ideas are completely sort of independent and can, right, they, they overlap. Where I think you could make an even stronger case for sort of pure conver convergence is to look at some of the things that you might see in Taoism or Buddhism mm -hmm. that are also about, you know, no, you get the yin and the yang, you, you cultivate chi, but that makes you one with the Tao and you enter that, right? And so you get, yeah, the same kind of grammar keeps coming up again. But what, what you see, what, what Plato had and what Taoism had, right? And, and then we could maybe talk about the, the challenge facing Jung is Plato and Taoism also create a worldview that was intellectually and philosophically acceptable, uh, right? for that process so that people had a shared framework in which they could compare and contrast and correct either, each other's courses. And, and the thing is, we don't have that, right? We don't have that. We have a, we have a scientific worldview, right? That doesn't do that for us. And again, one more time, I'm deeply committed to the scientific worldview. I am not, you know, a Luddite uh, in, in some fashion. And so part of the tension I see in Jung and this is not meant, this is not, this isn't a criticism, I, I don't think. I think it's an observation. But part of the tension I see in Jung is him, is him trying to figure out how do I, and you see this especially in the later work, and you see it in his interaction with Corbin, because Corbin has it, Corbin tries to tackle this problem by putting my finger on him. You can see it in the Uranus uh, lecture. And so his interaction with Corbin, and part of the problem is, yeah, but how do I take all this, you know, this inner psychodynamic stuff, and how do I connect that ultimately to a metaphysics. Now, for the longest time, he's reticent. He does, I don't want to talk, he's supposed to say, I won't talk about the metaphysics and he invokes Kant and blah, blah, blah. But towards the end, you can see him. And I think maybe that has to do with his own insight, maybe because of the interaction with Corbin and others saying, no, I can't, I can't stay silent on that, that side of the thing. How people attune, how people attune to their worldview is deeply resonant with this whole inner psychodynamic process. And so it's a shame that more people don't know of Corbin because Corbin was deeply influential on Jung. Um, a lot of uh, Jung, Jung attributes some of his uh, some of his key insights to to Corbin. And so uh, I think if people who are interested in Jung uh, would open up uh, the dialogue and see the interaction with Corbin and see that this needs to be addressed, and that Jung, I think, towards the end, um, my, my friend and colleague, he's, um, he's he's a practicing psychotherapist and. Um, he works with me in the lab. Anderson Todd, he's actually been making to me the case that towards the end of his career and thinking, Jung was reaching out in, a, in towards this idea of worldview attunement in a way that is um, not the same, but at least um, in good resonance with the work of Corbin. Hmm. Uh, can we switch over to the Eastern view and how that's addressed there? Because you mentioned that it does come with a sort of a, a metaphysics or a cosmology. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying that we can just adopt Buddhist cosmology or Taoist uh, uh, cosmology. Again, uh, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very critical of sort of you know, nostalgic or utopic uh, visions, because they, they're, they're exactly the thing we, we criticized at the beginning. There's the, here's the one final complete thing. And if I can just, if I can just get back to that, or if I can just get to that, then it'll all be fine. And so that's the reasons we've discussed, I think quite well, uh, I, I'm critical of that. But I, I, I'm very interested, therefore, in people who work very deeply to try and integrate those two together. So I think, I, I don't know if I've mentioned it yet. I've mentioned it, uh, uh, I've tweeted about it. I tweeted about this and when I do uh, the, the book recommendations. I'm very interested in the Kyoto School. Um, so the Kyoto School is people uh, uh, like, uh, well, many people say D.T. Suzuki is the be at the beginning of that. Uh, but you've got uh, Nishida, I think is the pivotal figure and Nishitani and uh, Maso Abe and people like this, because what they were explicitly trying to do was connect, integrate, in a really deep fashion, uh, integrate um, uh, aspects of Buddhist philosophy. Again, Buddhist philosophy is always a practice, not just a set of beliefs, but integrate Buddhist philosophy uh, with Western philosophy uh, in a profound way. Uh, in fact, I would argue 
maybe I would argue, I, co I can't argue, so I'm just going to make a recommendation on the, the basis of an argument I don't have time to give right now, that Nishitani's book, Religion and Nothingness, I read this book twice, I would put it in the top five books written about the problem of nihilism ever um, mm. uh, from the Kyoto School. And uh, so that attempt to uh, try and see how can we integrate Buddhist ontology um, and and, and a Buddhist ontology is always a transformational ontology. It's not a static one, right? How can we integrate that with sort of some of the best work within the West on what our ontology is? How can we get our deepest cognitive, cultural, ontological grammar to sync up? And, right, and, and, and again, it's not just importing this. It's about a reciprocal reconstruction between the two. And, 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 and precisely... Uh, uh, in order to try and address the meaning crisis. That's, that's religion and nothingness is about explicitly that project. You know, it's a profound argument, but let me give you at least a taste of what this does. Uh, Nishitani argues, and he argues that part of the problem with the West in encountering nihilism is that we tend to experience no thingness, emptiness, non-being in a purely privative fashion as a lack. Uh, David Roy has a book that I just purchased called Lack and Transcendence, where we tend, we experience this all as a lack. It's interesting because in the Tao Te Chen, right, it talks about, you know, we shape the cup, but it's the space inside that we actually use, right? You have the wheel turning, but it, it turns on the emptiness at the hub, right? And so Nishitani's point is the East has developed a different way of, instead of trying to get to some stable, permanent ground, it's got a way of doing this fundamental insight, this aspect shift on groundlessness. And instead of experiencing it as privative, you experience it as a, as a real potential uh, for that ongoing uh, transformation. Now, that is something I can say in words fairly readily, Right. But that's not the point of Nishitani's book is no, no. What do you have to you have to really get into these two grammars intellectually. Right. And or do a lot of philosophical work. And on, but he's also clear. But you also have to be doing all these practices before you can actually live what I just said. Right. Um, and getting and it's it's interesting, again, how getting people to that, right, getting it them not just to just to believe it belief is is necessary but radically insufficient but but getting them to that i i think was one of the core things that nishitani is like pushing on and so i see more and more that we can have that kind of that we can do something similar with the kyoto school uh we can take right our our, our best work now i would say uh, it's in cognitive science because cognitive science incorporates philosophy and, and we can interact with these other traditions in a deeply respectful manner. Also, our own historical traditions like Neoplatonism, Stoicism, right, and try and do exactly that. Can we do a reciprocal reconstruction that tells us how, not only that, but how to really restructure and transform our cultural cognitive grammar so that we can address the meaning crisis. I really, for me, the Kyoto School is a clear example, an exemplary example, right, of that this is very possible for us. This is very doable. Do you see a role for psychedelics as one of these kind of processes that can be used to get meaning? Sure. <clears throat> so, I, 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 I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I talk about this. And this goes back to a, a much earlier important leap, right? The Upper Paleolithic transition in which people, various people, I got to interact with him. I recently uh, did, a, I, I did a presentation on shamanism and Michael Winkleman, who literally wrote the book on shamanism, did a presentation and Matt Rossano, I've met him. Um, and of course there's other people like Lewis, a whole host of people that's saying, you know, it's probably um, the, the shamanic uh, ecology of psychotechnologies that drives this huge, you know, transformation in consciousness and cognition we see in the upper Paleolithic transition. So I think, uh, because, you know, I, I think there's good cognitive scientific reasons for this. But psychedelics are really radical frame breakers. Yeah. That's what they are. They're, they're radical. They're, they do two things. They break, wow, they disidentify you from your frame. And then, and then they break that frame up. And then they also do something. They throw enough noise into your system that it becomes possible for you to see the world differently, right? Possible. Yeah. Now, 
one point on that, right? This is lining up, this is convergent with people in machine learning who don't study psychedelics. Well, most of them don't study psychedelics or cognitive or, or study altered states of consciousness. But right, when you're trying to get a neural network to learn, you need to, in order for it to self-optimize, you need to throw disruption into it. You need to throw noise into it because if you don't, it will do something we were criticizing earlier. It will fixate on a too premature a pattern. This is called overfitting to the data. And you have to periodically throw noise into it, right? And that will open it up. The same thing, by the way, for you, right? The way to enhance your insight is when you're locked and you can't solve a problem, the stuff about incubation, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, dreaming doesn't afford insight. I'm not sure that just sort of going away because what the evidence seems to show is actually what's most effective is mild distraction, introducing some noise. Like, so if I'm giving you a, a, an insight problem you're trying to solve and you can't solve it, and I sort of actually shake the screen on the computer or make it more staticky, that will actually help trigger an insight. So, right, you've got psychological and machine learning saying that, no, when you do, when you want, when you want to really afford this, you got to put in, right, uh, the, the this, this, this noise because it helps break frame and it also makes possible you exploring, you know, configurations of your processing that are allowing you, like, again, to see the world in a new way, right? You're making a new frame. And, and psychedelics can do both of that. They can, they're massively disruptive. By the way, that's not the only disruptive strategy people use. You know, people use lots of disruptive strategies, sleep deprivation, sex deprivation, like, like uh, food deprivation, fasting, right? There's all kinds of disruptive strategies. Again, cross-culturally, cross-historically, people pursue this. So the psychedelics can disrupt, break your frame, and they can also throw enough noise that self-optimization is possible. But that's the pivot point, right? And that's where we got to really slow down because just like the drug itself isn't the cause of addiction, right? look, addiction is reciprocal narrowing. Self-transcendence is reciprocal opening, right? And just and if we fixate on the drug, we don't properly understand addiction. If we fixate on the drug, we don't properly understand self-transcendence. The drug makes that reciprocal opening possible. But what you need are skills to help, because you're messing with what you find salient. You need a lot of skills that properly situate that so you can critique the self-deception. You need a community of others that can help critique the tendency towards self-deception. You need a whole ecology of practices for that reciprocal opening up. You need what we've been constantly coming back to. You need a well-validated, vetted, guarded and guided course of development to situate the psychedelics within. If you have all of that, then the psychedelics can play a crucial role. If you situate the psychedelics, like I say, to broadly say, in some sort of ritual, communal, sapiential course of uh, cultivating self-transcendence and wisdom, then they can be tremendously beneficial. If you do it just as isolated thing, there is a great chance it will just exacerbate your capacity to bullshit yourself and do that autodidactic thing. Yeah. So I, I, I say two things and when I first say it, people think, what? That sounds like a contradiction. I am deeply critical. I, I, I oppose the government. I'm talking for adults. I'm not talking for children. I'm opposed to the government exercising any prohibition on right, things that alter our state of consciousness because they, the prohibition doesn't work. Right, it doesn't work. It doesn't prevent addiction. It doesn't. It, it doesn't work, and it just gives a source of income for organized crime and all kinds of stuff. But on the other hand, I'm opposed to people, a culture. I'm opposed to a culture of recreational drug use. Right, I, I, it's, it's like saying I want to play with chainsaws. What? <laughs> chainsaws are really powerful and useful tools, but you right. No, I, I, I mean, I mean frivolous play. I don't mean serious play. If somebody says, "Oh, I, I want to get, I want to, I want to get the sort of serious ability that a musician has to play music," then I agree with them. But if they mean, "No, I just want to sort of have fun with chainsaws," it's like, "No, that's a really, really bad idea. That's you're probably going to hurt yourself. You're probably going to hurt yourself." Uh, Mark Hayden argues that we people, sh and I agree with him. Uh, people should have to go through certification programs. We do this for driving a car. Right. We do this. We do this whenever we're going to do something like that has the potential for great harm. We say, well, you know, you should get properly educated. People should have to go through a course. They should commit to 
some regular supervision, they get certified, and then they can use these. That seems to me to be uh, a very good proposal. I agree, I agree, I agree wholeheartedly with that. There is, there's a reason I brought this up because there's an experience I had um, taking vaped DMT with... Um... Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Uh, with uh, Syrian rue, which is the other active ingredient to make ayahuasca. Except when you right. vape it, it's a lot stronger and it's Im immediately reacting. And um, I won't go into the full details of the, the trip, but one thing that really stood out to me was this kind of uh, what I, I like to call a meaning jammer. It was like, yeah. every time I've previously done psychedelics, I've attempted to, to latch onto some story or meaning or something that makes sense of the experience, bring it back so I can tell the story. And in some cases, I've been doing that as an influence from doing this podcast. I want to be able to tell some story on the podcast. Sure. And so I did this particularly powerful dose and then um, basically was met with this meaning jammer. It was like a... If you see a sine wave and you get an equal and an opposite sine wave, it completely just cancels everything out. And any right. thought I had in, I had an equal and opposite response to it. And it felt like torture, oh. actually. It, it felt yeah. really not fun at all. And I was really having a bad time with it. And I came out of that and it just stuck with me for, for months. Um, and I realized it was this attachment to meaning that I was trying. I mean, that's, that's my interpretation of it. I don't know what empirically sure, sure. it was, but that, this attachment to meaning was something I was getting stuck in in my exploration, right. and um, by you know by having this forceful stripping away of meaning, I was able to first of all separate meaning onto this into this place where I could start to deconstruct it, surgery it apart, and, and figure out what is meaning, why does it have meaning, why is it meaningful to me, and it was a very powerful experience. So it, this kind of begs my next question, which is. What do you think the role of deconstruction of meaning uh, and de destruction of meaning could play in the meaning crisis? Ah, well, first of all, I mean, that's part of, I mean, that goes towards the Nishitani thing, right? You are getting, if you'll allow me to, I don't wanna, I don't wanna bully your phenomenology, uh, <laughs> but so, uh, and I mean, I've sat with somebody who did DMT and stuff like that. So I, 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 you know, um, I have some familiarity, but I, you were there, I wasn't, but, it seems to me that you, part of what's going on is you you are being told no no no, uh, you know you're you're latching on to a substantive notive of meaning and you're you're not cap you're not capturing right uh, uh, the, the 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 no thingness that's also really really crucial and that's also I would suggest gently um, is because you're fixating on a product and not really identifying with the process and so I mean. What would have helped you, for example, is if, right, you'd gone into perhaps, well, I mean, you could take a look at Zen, but even within our own Western tradition, you have Pyrrhonian skepticism from Pyro. And they actually had a practice where wherever you gave a, an argument for one side, you developed, right, an argument for the other side, isothenia. And the point was to get to a point where you could actually suspend, right, commitment to a particular argument. And, and, and then that was supposed to bring out a deeper sense of connectedness. I think we're supposed to access these perspectival and procedural and participatory processes that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, like, I, I think that deconstruct, I mean, the way that can be spoken of is not the way, or you read Nargajuna, like, right? And it's, it's, it, it's the, 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 so, but here's, here's what I would say upon, you know, I, you know, deeply studying this, all, some of these traditions, not just in the text, but practices. And some of my own experience and and lots of discussion with other people i think the self-dissolving aspect of meaning and the self-organizing aspect of meaning are inseparably they're not logically identical but they're inseparably one mm -hmm. right that 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 and, and i think that's part of again what nishitani was arguing that the, and that though so and, and you see it a little bit right i think Taoism tends to emphasize a little bit more the self-organization and you know, uh, Nargajuna's Buddhism tends to emphasize more the self-dissolving. And you have to remember that the self-dissolving is also self-dissolving, right? And, and the self-organizing is also self-organizing. Yeah. And the relationship between them is both self-organizing and self-dissolving. And you get sort of meta on this. And, and, it, and, and instead of trying to sort of, you know, cons have a stable conceptualization of that expanding, you just let it expand, right? You just let it expand. Um, and so I, I think that that is just... And, and, I think that's an acceptation of 
a deep acceptation of that disruptive strategy that's so integral to the evolving, ongoing evolving of your fittedness to yourself, to the world, to others. And it's the evolution that is itself the meaning. It's, it's not something that it, 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 we, because of language, we have to say something is evolving, but the, the evolution of the meaning is the meaning, right? And, and, and you're not evolved, it's not teleological. It's not like I have to get there and then I will have received meaning for the process. No, that's not what I'm, that's not what Yeah, I'm that, that feels quite accurate as an explanation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, it's it's funny how much is related in this sort of um, Western rationalist perspective of wanting to. Well, we started off this conversation with um, latching onto "I'm right, you're wrong," uh, latching onto meaning as far as like something I collect and share with others, which was my experience with the DMT trip. Like, there, there's something about all of these; they feel related in this desire to find concreteness in reality. Yeah. And so there's definitely that. And like I said, I think that goes towards, we've talked about some of the cognitive biases that drive that. I think there's also a psychodynamic bias, or at least a personality bias, I would put towards that, that's really culturally driven. Um, and this, I mean, you, this is much later in the series when I talk about uh, Luther, um, and then I, when I talk about romanticism, I tend to be a little too harsh on romanticism. I'm critical of how it is for us in our culture today, a very decadent form of it. But what am I trying to get at? I'm trying to get at this notion that's articulated around narcissism. I'm not accusing you of being a narcissist, but part of what we, what our cultural grammar is, is I need to constantly reflect on my autobiography because I need to find the uniqueness. I need to find the specialness because that uniqueness and that specialness, right? That's my true self that I've always had. If I can just find that and hold that up, then I will forever shine against the darkness of non-being. Yeah. When I say it that way, right? I'm trying to make it heroic while at the same time ridiculing it because it has that heroic feeling and, 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 and part of it, is wrapped up with you know this existential discourse about authenticity there's an important idea in authenticity but it's wrapped up that what authenticity means is being true to myself and so my identity is something i have rather than something i become or aspire to and the way i have it is by finding what i have that nobody else has and holding on to that and so what i want to do to be spiritual is i want to collect these little gems of specialness <laughs> and collect them together and i'll put and then what i have is here's my autobiographical yeah. shelf <laughs> in which i put all my gems of specialness and they shine and they shine and they shine and look at how glorious i am and i think so and i mean the fact that you have a president in the united states who's you know whatever your politics are i think people on both left and the right have to acknowledge that this guy is a a deep narcissist, oh, yeah. right? He like he's deeply narcissistic, and 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 I and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think narcissism, right, is 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 growing in our culture. It's growing with the sense of bullshit, right, which is not the same thing as lying. I'm using bullshit in a very technical sense, which I argue about in the series, right, um, uh, right. That that's growing, and then that that interacts with these perennial patterns, right? These perennial patterns of you know, fixating on the product, not paying attention to the process, right? But also, it also interacts with this other historical factor of starving for meaning. And so I want I want something concrete, fast, that I can hold on to, and that's special, and that it's mine, right? Or, right? And so I think all of those things are reinforcing each other in really, really powerful ways. This seems, and maybe it's just because I'm part of this generation, but it seems like this is particularly focused and... and um a particular problem in our generation, especially post-internet, um, everyone is, it's almost like um, social currency is the new currency. It's like you, you can make money if you've got the most likes. Um, the culture is kind of surrounding our, this idea of yep. popularity. And then because it's so competitive and we find ourselves in the exact same space doing the exact same thing, it's so competitive. So you need that yeah, unique yeah. thing yeah. to make you stand out. So yep. it doesn't seem like there's any kind of... Uh, escape from that in well, our current culture i mean th there is and there isn't uh, and so i, I for example i, I uh, um th th you can you can you can try sorry this is self-promotional 
Um, I'm trying to use them. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. So I, I, I realized the irony of what I was about to do. Uh, but what I'm trying to do with the video series is to say, no, 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 I'm not going to sort of, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, right, make arguments and trace lines of development. And I'm going to try and, right, uh, uh, to be comprehensive. Uh, 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 maybe there's something unique in it. Sure, I have to try and promote it, but I try and make that quest for uniqueness subservient to the quest of rigorous comprehensiveness yeah. and and seriously, seriously trying to engender dialogue with other people. That's why I am so careful to constantly try and give other people credit to show that even the video series is a community production, right? There's lots of people that are participating in the process of this and are dialoguing around it. So that's what that's what that's what I mean. Yes, I, the the uniqueness is indispensability because we are in the marketplace of attention. But we couldn't put this. We don't have to just collapse to it, right? We can make it in service of right. We can use it if you'll allow me, right, to draw people in, right? To no, but there's an alternative way. There is an alternative way. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to come back to the idea of bullshit because I really yes. like. <laughs> uh, you really like bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> no, I really like um, that you brought that into your uh, your series. Yeah. And that you talk about this uh, capacity for self deception and that we can't technically lie to ourselves, but we That's bullshit right. ourselves all the time. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, we. So, I mean, this is it's based on. Uh, um, uh, uh, Harry Frankfurt's seminal uh, uh, essay on bullshit, and then there's been some great ph philosophical discussion, and there's even now, uh, you know, psychological investigation of bullshitting. Uh, and so I've sort of drawn that all together and come up with sort of this idea: you can't lie to yourself because the liar depends on your commitment to truth, right? So what if I if, if I want you to believe that 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 something that's not true, that you know Peter likes you. I, I, I do stuff to get you to believe it because if you believe it's true, then I can manipulate your behavior precisely because you commit to what you believe is true. Mm -hmm. so, right? And, and people who say, well, I don't believe in truth. It's like, well, I, I bet you don't like being lied to. Like, what do you mean when you say you don't, you don't believe in truth? Like, you don't like being lied to because your commitment to the truth makes you manipulable, right? And et cetera. So you can't lie to yourself. So we use the metaphor of lying to ourselves as a way of, trying to, to talk about self-deception. And, and, and that's misleading in two ways. First of all, you can't lie to yourself. It's misleading in three ways, sorry. You can't lie to yourself. Beliefs aren't things you just do. You can't just believe something, right? Like, have a, think of a belief you want to have. Everybody loves you. Okay, believe it. Go, right? You can imagine it. You can desire it. You can't just believe it. That's not how belief works. And then third, this metaphor puts us at the level of propositional thinking again, right? It, it thinks that that's all that we should be paying attention to. Now, the bullshit artist is different. The bullshit artist tries to get you unconcerned with the truth. And that's sort of a Frankfurt's uh, explicit insight. And then he indicates other things that I think he's implying and that I try and draw that out and extend it. Because what the bullshit artist is relying on to manipulate you is, is, is to get you indifferent to the truth, which is what you can see in our political discourse now, right? the indifference to whether or not it's true. So if I can't use truth to manipulate you, what can I do? Well, I can use the fact that you find things salient, that they're catchy, they grab your attention. If I clap my hands, it grabs your attention, right? It arouses you, it, it motivates you into an affective state, right? And so the, bu the bullshit artist famously does things that are catchy to us, that, right, <sighs> oh, they, they cause a rush of, uh, of involvement. Uh, so I, I used to use, well, it still works, I suppose. Um, I, I, I suppose I could get better examples uh, from the current political arena, but there was an episode from The Simpsons. It was a political episode where these two aliens are running for office. And the, the, uh, I, I forget what the political office is, and they're giving a speech, and the alien says something. My fellow Americans, when I was young, I dreamt of being a baseball, but we must move forward not backwards, upwards, not backwards, twirling, twirling towards freedom. And everybody <laughs> cheers because if you're an American, right? You sort of, there's sort of a rush. He's not saying anything, right? He's literally not making any claims that, right? Right. And, but you, but you don't, you, you don't, and here's what, this is what, this slow down. This is really careful. You don't care that he's not saying anything. You don't care 
if there's any truth value to that, if there's any content to it, because you're caught up in the rush. This is how advertising works. You know that drinking this alcohol will not make you enormously attractive to other people. Go into a bar, doesn't right? But if you, you watch the commercial, you're drinking this alcohol and all these attractive people around, you know that's not true. <laughs> doesn't matter. What do you do? It's more salient to you, you buy the product, right? Now, here's the thing about salience. Salience is got this weird self-organizing. Uh, when I clap my hands, that draws your attention, but you can also direct your attention to make something more salient. I can say, think of your right big toe right now. Now it's salient to you. You're aware of it. It's standing out for you. So notice what I can do. I can, I can direct my attention to make something more salient. And then that will make it more catchy to me, more likely to draw my attention, which means that I can then, right? You see what I'm doing? I can yeah. loop myself in until my behavior is drawn and directed by how catchy that is. And that is, I think, part of the fundamental machinery. Uh, so the adaptive self-organizing nature of your attention can be hijacked in a self-deceptive fashion. So you bullshit yourself into being manipulated, you know, either by impulses within you that are not consonant with your long-term developmental goals or more as, as, as is often by other people who are trying to exploit you for their goals and to your detriment. See, self-deception, the term is also, it's a little bit too isolating in a term. We think it's only a matter of the self, but self-deception is also deeply enmeshed in how other people can deceive and manipulate you. Mm -hmm. and so then, that's what I mean. That's what I mean by bullshit and how it's... Mm -hmm connected with self-deception. And then that same uh, process of uh, willfully pointing your attention over and over at something can also be harnessed to de-bullshit yes. yourself. So the reciprocal narrowing can be transformed into the reciprocal opening up. And what's interesting about that, right, is, and this is what the research shows, I mean, that's the core of participatory knowing, right? When, I, when I'm coupled to something, I'm knowing something because I and it and I or thou, whichever, we're coupled together so that we are reciprocally opening each other up. So my knowing of it and my self-knowing are, they're not static, they're both opening up together. And that's what it is, that's the core of participatory knowing, right? And what's interesting about participatory knowing is if, if I put you with somebody and, they, and you start to do mutually accelerating disclosure, you, and this is part of what goes into these we space things, I think, right? Is I, if you start to disclose, and instead of this person attacking you, Right. If they if in response to your disclosure, they, they, they say, oh, they sense a connection and they start to disclose more of themselves. Right. Right. And then and then you disclose and then you do this mutually ex accelerating opening up. That's how you fall in love with somebody. I mean, that's how you can sort of put people into a situation and not necessarily sexual love, but some kind of love. Right. And so that participatory knowing, that's why it's off, that's why in many traditions like the, the Hebrew tradition. Right. It's, it's knowing by loving. Right. It's 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 like having it's like making love with something. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, and, and so, yes, that reciprocal narrowing, if you can if you can get a set of practices and a worldview attunement around it that can flip it, then it can become, yes, the reciprocal opening up very much. That reminds me of another point from your series uh, where the process of truth finding and the process of loving something or caring about something are not separate. Yes, very much, very much. Um, thank you for bringing that up. And I, I think that was one of the great, I think this goes back to Socrates in the Western tradition, but, um, but you can see it in, in many other traditions. I, the deep, and see, this is also, is also one of my criticisms of how people bring mindfulness into uh, the, the West, because right, not only is meta a, a, a contemplative practice that should be complementary put with vipassana, a meditative practice, meta is also about trying to afford that kind of knowing by loving, karuna, compassion. Compassion doesn't mean pity or sympathy or empathy. It means this kind of agapic, right, where you're affording something else is opening itself up, and you are allowing yourself to be opened up, right, um, and and. Uh, so the fact that that's not being discussed in the mindfulness revolution very much um, is, 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 is a mistake. But you, and this goes to the heart of my scientific work about relevance realization, you, but there's way too much information. And I don't just mean the internet. I mean, even if you're in a, a hunter-gatherer, in the, in the, right, there is, technically, there is, a, there is an, 
a combinatorial explosive amount of information in the environment. You cannot process it all. You have to select. You have to frame. So you, you can't be frameless, right? In the sense that you, you I, I can't look at everything. I, I'm finite. I am deeply finite in that way. I can grow. I can grow, but I'm finite, right? And so what you have to do is you have to, right? You think about like this um, in, in playing a game of chess. If you were to try and uh, calculate all the possible combinations and permutations of moves, the, the, the search space of possible courses of actions you could take to, pl to, take to uh, play chess is larger than the number of atomic particles in the universe. <laughs> That's just for playing a game of chess. Right. So you know what you don't you know what you can't do? You can't search all that information. So what do you do? Well, you direct your attention. You focus on the center board. You try and control the center board. You try and protect your king. The thing is, those help because you can't search all the space, but they don't guarantee you winning. This is a deep reason why there's no final solution to what's relevant or important. It can't be right. Because the only way you could get the final solution was to do the impossible, which is to, to search the infinity, right? And so what does that mean? Well, I'm all, but, it, but this process, this is why it's evolving. When, when, if I frame and I realize that I misframed and that I need an insight, right? It's self-correcting. So the process is not just selecting, it's self-corrective selection. Right? That's what I mean by it's, a kind, it's always evolving what you find salient or relevant in the environment. And you have to do that or you can't reason, you can't problem solve, you can't think. You say, well, I can reason my way through it. You can only reason after you've chosen what you're going to represent. And how you represent something is you have to direct your attention to it. Out of all of its features, you have to select some as important and as relevant to you and as to the problem you're going to solve. If I try to pick up on all of the properties of this thing, that's the last thing I'm going to do in my life. Right? And when, if I'm going to make an inference, do I, do I, do I, okay, I have its represent, this is a pen. Now I want to make an inference about it. What, what are all the implications, the logical, the set, the logical possibilities of all the implications is also combinatorially explosive. So out of all of those, I have to select the one that is relevant to the problem. You see what I'm trying to show you, right? The relevance realization is foundational to representation, to reasoning, to problem solving. I'm going to go into the, you can read my publications, some of my talks. I'm going to go into this in detail in the series. So I can only gesture towards it here. But here's the thing. Relevance realization is not cold calculation. Yes, it's this ongoing evolved and fittingness. Think about it. Here's an analogy for it, right? An, organ an organism is fitted to its environment so that it survives long enough, so it has fitness, so it survives long enough to reproduce, right? But there is no, there is no essence to fittedness. Some creatures are fit by being tall, short, hard, soft. You see what I'm saying? There's no essence to fittedness. What did Darwin show? Fittedness is inseparable for the ongoing, constantly self-organizing, redesigning of fittedness. The yeah. evolution of fittedness is constitutive of fittedness. And so your brain is doing something deeply analogous to that. It's constantly evolving its sensory motor fittedness to the environment. This is, by the way, why there's no essence, no final solution to relevance. But here's the thing I want to get back to. If you agree that all of that is plausible, then you have to understand that relevance realization is not cold calculation. Relevance realization is deeply constitutive of who and what I am and who and what my world is. And it is always a risky gamble because I am, I am choose, here's my precious limited resources of cognition and processing power, time, right? I have very limited time and resources. I have, remember, we, we pay attention. We mm. pay attention, right? Okay, so, right, I have this very, right, very, and I, I have to make a choice that is therefore deeply, effectively laden for me, right? Like, it, it, it's so risky, and, and the, process, it, the, the, the processes are so valuable to me that, Right? And so what, and what I have to do is I have to arouse my, meta, my metabolism. I have to motivate, I have to, because I have to commit and involve myself with my choice, right? So this is always laden. That's why 
relevance realization, and I'm, I'm using this, this word, I hope in a way consonant with Heidegger, relevance realization is always caring about some information rather than caring about other information. And so it's deeply bound up with how we care, how we care about information because of how we have to take care of ourselves. We are literally beings that are constituted. We are self-organized to care about ourselves, to take care of ourselves, to take care of each other. And we care about information because we take care of ourselves and take care of each other. And, but, but of course, what we can do is learn to take better care of how we're caring. And that's part of the growth. But that's why relevance, realization, and caring are deeply bound together. And that's why I think our deepest kind of knowing is participatory knowing, knowing by loving. Now, I'm not saying that we should leave that. I'm not a romantic. Oh, just trust in that. Trust your heart. <laughs> right? No, no. We have to bring rationality to that like everything else. But to say that it's foundational in, in this procedural sense, not in an epist epistemological sense, but to say it's, 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 it's grounding in this sense is not to say that we shouldn't try and optimize it, make it more rational, uh, put it into a course of sapiential development. No, exactly the opposite. Because it is such a grounding thing, the knowing by loving, we have to give it our most care. And this was Socrates' great insight. Right? He, 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 you know, many people know that Socrates claimed, well, I don't know. Well, he, he does claim to know. He, he claims to know ta erotica. He, he claims to know how to love well, right? And he doesn't mean just sort of sexual, expo you know, exploits in bed or something like that. You know, you, you've got this whole cycle of, well, at first I'm attracted to the concrete beautiful things, but if I open that up, right, that changes me a little bit. And then I can be more attracted to, to more deeper patterns of beauty and then that, that makes me a deeper person and then i can write i can move to even deeper pattern and so forth and that's this process of love right and it's a love for what's most beautiful and there you go you get an evolution right uh towards a depth of uh, being so that's how i see those uh, deeply uh, interwoven together and then uh, and a lot of socratic rationality is not a rationality just of argumentation which mm. people see in socrates but it's in service of a rationality of caring. Now, Socrates would go into the marketplace and say, look at all the things I don't need. <laughs> he would come up to people and say, you've spent a lot of time on your hair today. How much time have you spent on your soul? <laughs> right? There's a guy who is knowing certain things. He's knowing what to care about. And, he, and the, the argumentative stuff, the Enlankus, is in the service of trying to get us more rationally right, engaged with this participatory knowing, the caring that is so central to our cognitive agency. The, there's a pattern here, and the, the best way I can describe it is just integration of the different capacities of the human being, both as an individual and a society. And there seems to be some sort of decoherence happening right now where all of these different capacities that we have are disjointed from each other. And what we need to do is bring them back into coherence. I, yeah, I think there's I think there's deep reasons for that. Um, I, I, so we can see a lot of the processes that we are and the, uh, in the ecology, the environment. They're self-organizing processes. They're they're dynamic, and, and this is right. And they're complex, and they give us complex problems, not just complicated problems. To use uh, one of Jordan's distinctions, Jordan Hall's distinctions. Yeah, um, and, and so the thing about those is. I would say, I, I would agree with the word integration, but I, I, I tend to use a term from machine learning of optimization, right? So maximization is when I take some value and I try to get a maximum of it, right? Uh, but typically, I, typically my goals are in trade-off relationships. Let me give you an example uh, about this uh, evolving your fittedness to the environment that's um, part of your sort of autonomic nervous system, okay? So you have to you have to have a level of arousal that's appropriate to your environment. So ah, that's too much arousal, right? Uh, that's too little, right? And the and, and 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 the solution is not to be sort of Canadian and have sort of a constantly middling level of arousal because then you can't run away from the tiger and you also can't fall asleep because you're middlingly aroused. You need to be able to you see there, there's in a trade-off relationship. And so what evolution has done, sorry, I have to speak about evolution as if it's an agent because that's what language makes me do, right? You've got it, you're autonomic, autonomic, self-governing, autonomous, self-organizing, uh, 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 
uh, autonomic nervous system, and it's divided into two systems, the sympathetic, and the sympathetic is trying to interpret as much as it can in the environment as, ah, raise arousal, raise arousal, right? And then the parasympathetic is trying to interpret as much as it can in the environment. So they're both biased. Notice that language. They're both biased. The parasympathetic is trying to interpret anything it can as, ah, I should move towards sleep, reduce arousal, heal, right? And so they're, they're biased in their interpretation, but they're locked together, right? They're, uh, right? So they're, this is called opponent processing. Now notice how this is different from adversarial because they share a common goal of being committed to the process. Right, but they're constantly pulling at, on each other like this, and so what happens is your autonomic nervous system is in a constantly self-organizing manner, redesigning your level of arousal on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So the self-organization uses opponent processing to try and optimize between two goals that have a trade-off relationship with each other. Many, I would argue, most of our goals have trade-off relationships with other goals. And what we need is optimization processes, right? That integrate these things together in an opponent processing fashion. But for reasons we've already discussed, we are tending to, we are tending to reframe that, and I would say misframe that, as adversarial, winner take all, debunk, demolish, destroy the opposition. If the parasympathetic system were to win and defeat the sympathetic system, I would fall forever asleep. That is not what I, that is not adaptive. And so I think, right, I think this, what we're getting is, as you said, a decoherence. We're losing, uh, we're losing the commitment to an evolving uh, uh, opponent processing that is constantly, we op is optimizing us and that's not a static state. Optimization means it's an ongoing, evolving fittedness to the environment. We're losing that, and we're losing it in a profound way. And again, I think that's both a symptom of the meaning crisis, but something that feeds back and exacerbates the meaning crisis. I have one uh, more question here. We've got to wrap up. We're running out of time, but um, I'm, <laughs> I understand the irony of this question. I'm looking for a final answer. What? <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was coming, didn't you? Yeah. What is the what is the key takeaway? What are the the three points from your course? That... <laughs> yeah. Um. So I guess I I would say is that we need. We need a historical analysis that gets us aware of our, col our cultural cognitive grammar. And I sometimes reverse it because I don't want to prioritize it. The cognitive cultural grammar, right, uh, of meaning making. And we need that to be consonant with uh, a scientific analysis of it. And then we need that to be coordinated with an ecology of practices that are optimized uh, for uh, the, evolu the evolution that is constitutive of that meaning making, the cognitive sensory motor evolution, such that we, and, and I don't mean individually, I mean both individually and communally, so that the cultivation of wisdom becomes a serious and central individual and collective uh, cognitive and cultural pro project, so that people once again have the worldview attunement that affords the wisdom that allows them to respond to the perennial problems that come from our self-deceptive nature so that we can alleviate the loss of agency, the suffering that the meaning crisis is inflicting on an increasing number of people in very deleterious manner. All right, that was part two of the interview with John Verveke. If you haven't listened to part one of this interview, go to futurethinkers.org slash 98. And we highly recommend that you check out his Awakening from the Meaning Crisis lecture series, which is available on YouTube. You can find all the links and show notes from both parts of this interview by going to futurethinkers.org slash 98 and futurethinkers.org slash 99. And if you want to stay up to date with our latest episodes, blog posts, or news from Future Thinkers, join our mailing list at futurethinkers.org slash mailing list. To meet like-minded people, join our Future Thinkers Discord community. Go to futurethinkers.org slash discord. Check out our new course in Personal Evolution. Part one is on cultivating sovereignty and is designed to support you in developing more clarity about your direction and purpose in life, making better decisions, and having more agency to live your life on your own terms. 
Part two is on integrating the shadow and is designed to support you in overcoming nihilism and tapping into an inner source of energy, creativity, and wisdom to make meaningful progress towards actualizing your full potential. To learn more, go to courses.futurethinkers.org. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new videos. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. If you'd like to get a t-shirt like the new Make America Think Again, go to futurethinkers.org slash store. If you like what we do and you want to help us make more podcasts and videos, consider donating or becoming a patron at futurethinkers.org slash support. Also visit our sponsor Qualia and use the coupon code FUTURE to get 10% off your purchase.